I've had a ton of success, like blog posts, uh, like all that content that we know as you phrased it, like that's, that's my bread and butter. I've done that everywhere and have had so much success with, you know, the things that we all know convert really well, those list goals, alternatives, pages, etc. cetera. Uh, and that has generally worked here as well. But I think that, as I mentioned, the, I, I'm, I really like to go horizontally there. Like, let's get anything that anybody's calling our product. Hey, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Content Briefly. Today, we've got a great conversation with Jacob Rudnick. He's the head of content and SEO at a company called Softer, which is a no-code app builder, meaning you could take an Airtable base or a Google Sheet and use that as the basis of an app that folks could log in, interact, take some basic actions. I actually use it for two different things. One is a client portal for our marketplace, and another is a way for people to search, browse, help it be write a request. So if you see in our content collab channel in Slack, there's a list every day that gets posted of help a B2B writer request. Those all run on software. Anyways, we talk a lot about what it's like to market a product that can do almost anything for almost anyone. It's sort of a blessing and a curse to have so many use cases for so many different types of people. So we talk a little bit about how Jacob's narrowing down the target persona, narrowing down the best use cases for those people, and then how he's actually going about creating content. Everything from the awareness stage, helping people understand that no code is actually an option for them, all the way down to the tutorial stage where they're trying to learn how to do very specific things within the product. Lots of good stuff in here. Really enjoyed this conversation with Jacob Rudnick, and I hope you do too. This episode of Content Briefly is brought to you by our friends at Captain. Captain is the hyper-contextual AI-powered tool that can create, engage, and identify. It helps you create by turning customer interviews, company announcements, competitor comparisons, and educational material into rich content. It helps you engage by automatically including lead magnets, infographics, CTA, table of contents, and even AI-generated conversational podcasts in every piece of content that it creates. By the way, it integrates with any CMS. It helps you identify by seeing who your anonymous site visitors are, including their name, email, where they work, job title, LinkedIn profile, and more. So you always know if you're finding the right audience, and that'll help you close more deals. You can learn more in the webinar that we did with them, which will be linked in the show notes, and at contentcaptain.io. And just P.S., the Captain team also created echoreads.io, which turns written content into monologue or two-way dialogue podcasts. You can even just click to clone your own voice so you're the expert speaking. It's very cool and starts at just $19 a month with an option for a free trial. So that's echoreads.io. Thanks so much to our friends at Captain for supporting Superpath. Content Briefly is produced by our friends at Minutia. To learn more about their podcast production service, as well as their other adaptive content marketing services, check out minutia.com in the show notes. Hey everybody, Jimmy from Superpath here today with Jacob Rudnick. Uh, our first time meeting, uh, I am a customer of Softer, where you are the head of content and SEO. I have lots of questions for you about that. But maybe first, will you tell us a little bit about yourself, Jacob, and about your career to date so far also? You've, you've worked for some cool brands, uh, G2, Active Campaign, and a few others. So yeah, maybe give us like uh, kind of the arc of your career to date also. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Really nice to meet you in person finally after like years of being connected via LinkedIn and uh, community and stuff like that. Yeah, so I'm a head of content software, a head of content SEO, and I've been here six or seven months. Uh, I started, honestly, I, even outside of marketing, I've never taken a marketing or a business class in my entire life. I'm a history English student that went to J school, did a journalism master's, was a full time journalist for a year, freelance journalist, and I uh, was in sports, which means long hours, no pay, all that type of stuff. And so I got out, hope. Eventually, I think I, I make my way back in, but I got really lucky and was looking at content jobs of all sorts. And the company that I stumbled my way to just by honestly accident was G2 Crowd, which became G2. And I was employee number 30 ish, uh, right around their series. Oh, that's A. Early. Yeah. Yeah. Very early. We were, you know, they hired a bunch of kind of young folks with, I think, good uh, potential that they saw, but without like a clear like vision for a career. A lot of us came from way different backgrounds and uh, grew up with this company. And so went from 30 to maybe 450 there wow. <laughs> and started as a content specialist, which was a little bit of everything in the beginning. You know, it was literally how do we get 10 reviews for uh, any product? How do we build, you know, 10 of those products into a grid and a category and stuff like that? How do we add content to those uh, categories so they'll rank better. Like, what does that even mean? What's the playbook there? How do we scale this? All those like 
really V1 things that G2, like when you go to G2 right now, a lot of that stuff, the first version that we were creating and, you know, over four and a half years there really evolved. Like every six months was a new job, a new problem to solve, a new role, all this stuff. And so a couple of years in there, there's like a big vacuum, a research director had left, a head of SEO had left, and we were kind of losing traction and a lot of SERPs and just traffic for the first time ever in G2 history was really flatlining. So they're like, we need some people to f- kind of figure some of this stuff out. So uh, there's a longer story there, but end up kind of being one of those people that jumped in there and did, ended up really working on the content strategy and not just categories for the first time, but doing more of like tofu mofu stuff that like your tr- you know traditional SaaS, like HubSpot looking content that we had done for the first time. So kind of did that, had a lot of successes, like that first version, they hired a new CMO, kind of jumped in and took over the content marketing team there, scaled it to 22 writers. Uh, I left there uh, 2019, did a couple different stops. Uh, big ones were Scribe. I went there at Series A when they basically had a brand new website. Uh, went from zero blogs to 800 blogs in like a year and a half, kind of crazy oh, wow. uh, stuff with just two full-time people. Uh, jumped over to Active Campaign for a year. So I was there through March and was leading like content and video and uh, localization. And then uh, software and this opportunity came up. And I love the, the no-code space, see a ton of potential, love the angel investors and things. So it's been a little bit of jumping in the last few years, but really just like exciting opportunity after opportunity. So uh, that's that journey began. It all has it felt like an accident. I think a lot of people's careers do, but definitely feels like just leading wherever the winds take me, I guess. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. That's really interesting going from journalism to G2 because G2 is not just, you know, on page SEO for a blog post. You know, what, some of what you're describing is like learning about site architecture and technical SEO and category, but that's like, you know, that's like real SEO, not just how how many times we need to mention the keyword in this blog post to try to get it to rank. So that's, I mean, I just imagine that must have set like a really cool foundation for the way that you've gone on to mix content and SEO since then. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I think it's, I didn't even realize that in the moment, like how different some of that was, or even that I was doing SEO in some of those ways, right? A lot of times we were like adding information to databases, like through a sort of an interface that someone at G2 had built. And so you just are like inputting data, inputting data, but then seeing how that spits out in that architecture. And then as you got more experience, we're pulled into those calls, right? We're redesigning these sites, these categories, this content here. We're doing it across, you know, thousands of pages. Like, oh my gosh, this is like really kind of enterprise level SEO that I really haven't seen as much since, but I think it's set me up really nicely. And so a lot of things like that I do now with things are more programmatic, you know, that uh, you wouldn't, again, like software isn't like G2 in many ways, but some of this stuff where we're creating tons of pages and you want, formats and that information architecture and stuff, those lessons have really paid off, even if I'm not using it quite at the scale of G2. So yeah, yeah. again, I like learned, didn't even know we were doing SEO in the moment sometimes. And then you realize later, like a lot of that comes back and there's a lot of good lessons in there. Yeah, that's really cool. Really cool. So one thing I like to do with folks when they come on is try to understand a little bit about the business and the product and then talk about how you use content to reach those people. In this case, I'm a software customer and I have consumed a ton of software content, um, mostly tutorial style stuff, which is one of the things I was hoping to ask you about. So software, maybe I'll try to explain it. You tell me if I'm right. It's a way to use no code to build apps that clients can interact with. So like in, in super past case, I have two use cases. One is we use it for help a B2B writer. So help a B2B writer queries are stored in Airtable. Airtable is then the database that powers a website where people can go and search and browse all of the requests that come in on a day-to-day basis. So if you are in the Slack group and you go to our collaboration channel, you'll see a bunch of links to help a B2B writer request. That is, Those are links to a website which is run on software. And then the other is a client portal, which we use for our marketplace, which maybe that's like a more typical use case for software where, again, all the data is stored in Airtable and I'm giving different people access to that data in a way that shows them only their stuff, not other client stuff. And there's permissions and the software helps me manage the logins and passwords and all that stuff. Is that overly simplified or is that? More, no, more no. I think accurate? that was a, that's a great job. I think that last piece is really one of those true value props, right? Like for without code that you can manage how different people see content in a website or a portal. You know, I think the, 
for a while, we were way more horizontal and trying a lot of different things. We're still Series A and the company is, you know, only a few years old, honestly. So we're, it was a lot of seeing what stuck in that client portal. You're right. That's one of those core use cases where we've seen a ton of traction. There's like, that's our ICP where we're having the most success and we're seeing just the most happy, long lasting customers. Um, because again, they can, they can build something. It looks great for those customers. They can use, interact, get all the things they need without like very self service. Uh, but only the things they need. And you can, you know, both for their own, uh, like their company, they only see stuff for their company, but also down to the role level, right? Really granular, yeah. both at the page level, the block level, even. So there's a ton of customization and no code. There's definitely other things. It's not just client things like people will build, like we've personally built uh, like an employee portal. So we manage all of our time off and our benefits and things in the same way. So people do use it for internal only tools, but I agree with the the client assessment. That's like the most popular uh, use case for us. So really any sort of tool, people build all sorts of things. They build websites that are very public facing, they build marketplaces. Like we don't necessarily encourage those, but people have found ways to like really make uh, cool things with their business that way. People build CRM or a project management system or whatever else. So um, I think that like the flexibility and the customization just allows for a lot of different use cases. And for us that we'll get into that, I'm sure, but hard as a marketer, because you can, people can do almost anything that's yeah. like an app. Um, but where really should we be focusing with a 50 person team and the stage we're at and et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah, totally. I don't think Superpath exists without no code. You know, at least not in the way that it currently is, which is basically just me plus some contractors helping me out with a few things because like, I can't write code, but I can build a client portal, you know, and I can customize it to operate the way I want it to operate. And then I can hook it up with Zapier if I want and trigger some automations and things like that. And it's like pretty darn good, you know, and it's like incredibly affordable. Like I think I pay, you know, 50 bucks a month or something for software. It's like incredibly affordable for how powerful the tool is. Uh, it's also a lot of fun. I feel like uh, I don't. I haven't like seen like marketing around this, but like building no code is is genuinely fun. You know, to like have this idea of a client portal and then to be able to you know in an hour or two whip something up like kind of a basic version of it is is an amazing use of time. Like it's so different than all the other work I do, which is you know you have like admin stuff or you know, you gotta schedule your social posts, you got those things. But like to actually build something is is like really satisfying, you know? So just in general, I feel like software operates in like a really, uh, just like cool, optimistic, fun, satisfying, I don't, whatever, all these other adjectives, a space that, uh, I wonder if that gives you guys an advantage, you know, as you think about your own marketing. Yeah, it's super interesting. And I love that you say that. I agree with it. I don't, I think that we, we just had an offsite. We were in Europe where the company is based. It was a great couple of weeks together. Um, and talking about like, we believe that. I think the people that our community really strongly believes that as well. There's a ton when you've seen no code and built something like that and felt that magic, it's there. But I think the the broader population, even in tech, haven't built something with no code or sometimes don't even realize yeah. that they've done no code related things, right? They might have an Airtable database or a notion, but they didn't realize like they wouldn't call that no code, right? So there's some priming of the the market just that this is no code's a thing. It's possible. It is easier. And then there's fun. So there's like stages to this. But agree. I mean, as we were speaking, so I'm in the middle of a weeks long uh, dynasty fantasy football draft. And I've been like using all these different tools. I'm trying to combine these spreadsheets into a database that I can like create a tool for our league. And I, I'm not there yet. There's nothing to show you. But like, I think that there's an awesome use case to like build some like interfaces and some dashboards and mm, no code yeah. uh, for the league that don't exist in the tool again, with just a little bit of Zapier and some no code knowledge. So uh, it is fun, like using it. I've seen so many people do it for weird personal projects or side businesses or whatever else. And uh, I think there's the intimidation of building something on your own the first time. But once you've done that, I think it does get addictive. We see that with our community and our users for sure. Yeah. So that sort of gets to this really interesting content marketing challenge, which is a lot of different types of people can build a lot of different types of things. So where do you start? You know, that's a big question, obviously. Like I'm I'm gonna guess that you've narrowed it down to like there's a couple personas that we know uh have these couple of use cases which we like have data that shows that they're, you know, it's high value for them, they stick around, that kind of thing. Is that like how you think about where your content and SEO efforts are going? Yeah, one hundred percent. A lot of that was done um like that you know, they kind of software 
marketing and leadership in general, very smart, tons of technical people using no code and even our own tool to build a website and SEO. Like we get a few hundred thousand people a month and it's built off of software. Like that's what's running our website, even though that's not our prime use case. So a ton was done. There's like a lot of shots on goal basically for anyone can use this for anything, right? That's over exaggerating to some extent, but we've thrown a lot out there. Then we learn who is coming in, where are they signing up? How are they using the product? Are they paying? And if they're paying, do they stay, right? So for instance, we saw a ton of people using software to build MVPs. And like, that's great. But often they build an MVP, see traction, then they go and rebuild the tool somewhere else. And so they might stay for three months and then leave. And so not that we're against someone doing that necessarily, but as the long-term business decision, like there's issues with churn and things like that, right? So that's not necessarily the the mover we want to be. Just like you mentioned, like you called it out, client portals, awesome. People build a business. It's awesome for their clients. It's awesome for them. Everything's self-service. Once you put the resources in there and build all your systems, like you could obviously move that still, but it's affordable and it's doing exactly what you need and it's scalable, like awesome. So those people are really happy and they stay for a long time and then they build on top of that. So they build a client portal, then maybe they build that internal like project management system or something. So it's both like really sturdy and dependable and long lasting, but then those people like build on top of it and keep building their business. And so like client portal. Yeah. And then for me, I think that that is a big piece with a couple of different places like G2. So horizontal, we could write content really about any software category and right. we're trying to compete with all those. So it's been a lesson for me where I, I've been at a couple of places that are really horizontal, just like software. And I want to go wide, capture any uh, user that I can and hope like play that big net. But I think there's been a lesson here, even in the six months I've been here, is that focusing really tightly. One is good for SEO. You know, we get more authority and things like that. The interlinking is really tight. We can create nice funnels or, you know, whatever else. There's alignment to other parts of marketing. But that other piece is really like the user for one use case is not the same as another as far as like business value, both short and long term, right? The, the likelihood that they'll sign up, the likelihood that they'll stay in the product or they'll spend money with us and then stay with us. So really for us, like we've seen portal, for instance, be a ton, any sort of portal people are very happy with and stay with us for a long time. So anything around portals is really where I'm focusing now. And then I think we're going to build that playbook or we are in the process of building that playbook on all these, like what content is needed here? What, what do we need to learn? And then we can move to new and new ICPs. And I think we'll go further and further. There will be certainly some testing of both content types and like uh, the the use case itself that we go after, but really let's start where we're having enough traction and then expand from there and not try to spread ourselves too wide. Right, right. Does um, tutorial content fall under your purview? Um, it, there's a little bit of both. So we uh, just before I started, we hired an awesome community manager, JJ. He's been in the no code community for a long time. So this is somebody who knows no code in general has built courses and all these things. Like he's just awesome at building tutorial style content. So he'll do like build, like walkthrough builds, you know, under an hour, he'll build a tool either by himself or with someone. He'll just go on and we'll publish that to YouTube. And then you know, that will come over to me and we'll return that into a blog post, for instance. There's others that he hasn't gotten to, like how to build X that I'll build with a freelance writer. Uh, there's definitely some like bumps there, like do how well do they know the product? Do they know that use case? Like somebody again, like JJ, who's been in the space can do that really well. So as we've scaled, we've seen uh, different like levels of success there, but some of that does fall to me. So I'm often identifying those keywords, trying to find it like they're, they're really good for conversion, but it's a, it's a mix. I think the best, our best success there has been when it's collaborative, right? Me optimizing and formatting and all that stuff or leading that direction uh, someone like JJ or our product team leading really like, what are we building? How are we doing this? Showing off the the expertise of the product there. Uh, JJ recording it and then we, you know, work together. So I think it's that depends on who's driving. For me, it's like if I find an awesome keyword or, you know, really we see a lot like within, uh, you know, we hear from the community or we're seeing in feedback that people are using this use case over and over and we're seeing keyword volume, like I'll push that direction. But also, it'll come from their end too, right? We're launching a new data source or a new ICP. They'll lead that and then I'll go do the optimization or like the the back half of it, if that makes sense. So it can go Got both it, yeah. ways, but certainly a, a team effort at this stage. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. It's very, I find it interesting because like when, the way that I discovered software was I have this Airtable base of requests for help a B2B writer. And my very specific problem was how do I, or I was trying to think, is there a way that each record in this Airtable base could have its own unique URL so that I could share them? 
And so I'm Googling like, how do I use Airtable as a CMS? Like, can I turn, can I, is there a way to create a URL for each individual record and things like that? And I found software very quickly. And then I'm like instantly into tutorials. Like, okay, how does the list block work? Like software, you know, you have blocks that, you work, that help you sort of build apps. How does the list block work? Then I'm getting into that and it's like, okay, uh, how does the sign in work? So I'm like researching how that works. And now, you know, very quickly, like into the product, I probably skipped a lot of the marketing because I had this use case I was trying to solve. And I wonder, um, you, I guess you're thinking about both things. Like there's probably people like me who have a, th- a problem to solve. And then kind of, as you mentioned earlier, this other cohort of people who may not even realize this is possible, mm-hmm. but I'm guessing there's a lot more of those. Like the, the TAM there is massive versus like the probably smaller pool of people who want to, you know, make their Airtable database do something very specific yeah for sure so we see both sides and um you know the the software specific content that's like how to do something in software that a lot of that's been created too and we certainly update that but that'll happen in like the the product people product marketers like we support for sure but that ends yeah. up having happening very close to the product just because they're so intimate they're the ones building those features and things and sometimes you even find that in the community where the community is asked for something specifically we don't have a document but either community members answer that or will be in there as well. So I think that that could be one way. We've also tried to hit these like keywords and SEO potential where the intensity could be a little bit lower. It's not, you know, but this might be where you came in too. We've got, I don't know, 30 or 40 blog posts on how to do specific things in the Airtable. Uh, some are more related than others, but you know, the formatting of that database, how to connect this, how do you turn those uh, into their own URLs, right? If we can anticipate the problems that would make for a good software user, we want to create those how tos and then add, you know, a, a section of, okay, you, now that you have these URLs, this is actually, you could turn this into a full blown app with software, for instance, like to oversimplify that blog post. But we'll show yeah. you exactly how to do this. Uh, but also, here's a way to even maybe enhance because you didn't know that something like this existed. I think that's very common. Um, so, there's a little bit all over the place. We have to find people that's more upper funnel, right? Than people that are saying, I want to build a client portal. That's pretty mid heading down the funnel. Maybe they don't know the solutions, but they're looking. Um, so we're, we're all over the place for sure. And that's one of the, honestly, the, the huge opportunities. It makes me really excited, but also it is difficult. Where do you focus? Where's what's missing at the moment, right? Is it more about the, the awareness or is it that acquisition or is it the product education to keep people in the product staying longer and not churning? So uh, I think we're all of those can always be improved, but it's a, it's a balance each month. Honestly, like things change so quickly as we see success or see problems, right. Where, where there's big gaps. Yeah. Yeah. I, this, this content opportunity is just so massive. It's really cool and exciting, but it also feels a little overwhelming, you know, like we're talking about kind of straight up content, like as we all sort of know it, like create awareness, drive people down a funnel, you know, tutorial, product marketing slash tutorial type stuff, user generated content through the community, which I have discovered quite a few times on my own. It seems like Google has prioritized, uh, you know, you see more Reddit threads, you see more, mm-hmm. like if I search for something for Zapier, I always get the Zapier community, you know, stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's cool. I mean, I, in, in a sense, I envy you because there's so much fun stuff to work on. And in another sense, I don't <laughs> because it's probably very difficult to prioritize. Um, the one other thing I wanted to ask you about was sales. Is there a sales function at software or is this straight up PLG? Like 90 something percent PLG. There okay. is a, you know, someone who's definitely working in customer success and does that enterprise level sales. And, and so he's supporting this all the time and he's really good, but that it's both like, you know, he's building up that motion to some extent and just being really supportive of customers, but it hasn't been a big piece of the business. Really the the PLG, like letting people be self-service, I think that's a lot of just no code in general. Not all business no code business are built that way, but we've been really hands off there and uh, not using like the 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 resources, uh, you know, human resources as sales rather than building, spending that time building product and now finally doing like more marketing, uh, but really product and engineering and just make the best product, let community lead a ton of that. Now expanding like the SEO and other marketing efforts, but yeah, really little sales at this point. Got it. Got it. So I think you said you've been there six ish months, right? Yeah. Something like that. Has there been anything about the content that surprised you? Like any, something like you thought would work but hasn't or something that you thought was like 
you know, sort of like a throwaway thing that actually has worked really well? Yeah, it's a good question. So I've had a ton of success, like blog posts, uh, like all that content that we know, as you phrase it, like that's, that's my bread and butter. I've done that everywhere and have had so much success with, you know, the things that we all know convert really well, those listicles, alternatives, pages, et cetera. Uh, and that has generally worked here as well. But I think that, as I mentioned, the, I, I'm, I really like to go horizontally there. Like, let's get anything that anybody's calling our product. Like, I'll go into our backlinks and see what we've been linked to in other software lists, how people are mentioning us on social, especially with like a no code builder or when I was at Scribe. You know, we were kind of creating a new category. So what people were calling us wasn't necessarily what we were calling ourselves. So finding those mm-hmm. lists, there was a lot of opportunities there. I still really like that play. Uh, but I was, I think in my first few months here, I was trying to do all of those and really spreading us thin or spreading us wide instead of um, going deeper after some of these like true ICP. So this quarter, I've been more focusing like anything again, we do client portal wise is really crushing. Like it ranks right away. People engage with it. We know that ICP really well. And so this is the most technically complex tool I've had to use. Like it's it's easy in some ways, but there's so much you can do that. There's so much nuance depending ICP to ICP. And so I haven't had to know a product this intimately or know the ins and outs. So I don't know if that's like content. I think that is content wise where I can still publish pretty good blog posts optimized really well. I can make a rank, but do I really know the product well enough for this ICP and this specific user based on that keyword to really convince them that we're the best? That is, that's been my difficulty is like, I'm getting on the page one, but the conversions for client portal, which is like the first use case I knew and is something that makes sense to me. Those work really well. But some of these other ones, I'm getting a ton of traffic, but I'm not seeing that conversion the same way. And I think it's more about my product knowledge and if I'm really understanding that use case and how it connects to a keyword. So uh, I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah. But it's it's definitely one that the horizontal nature of the product, especially in your early days, um, it, it's there's difficulties, right? So it's, a, it's definitely yeah. a new problem for me and, and how our content's working. Yeah, that's very interesting, actually. Because you do come across companies probably further along in their life cycle where it's like the content team kind of figures out like, okay, this is the thing that works. So let's just do tons of that. And it sounds like you're earlier on in the journey. I mean, also you're dealing with uh, more variables too, you know, more ICPs, more use cases, things like that, <laughs> which leads me to another thing I want to ask you about, which is measurement. Are there a couple of data points that you're mostly focused on? You know, really just any, any kind of insight you can provide into way that you report and measure on content, I think would be really interesting. Yeah. So I, when I'm sending up like new content, especially I've got, I think about content really in a funnel and when I'll come back to more, uh, softer specific stuff that I think will be helpful. But you know, if I'm just launching new blog posts for the first time, or even like this first batch that I'm doing, it's like, is it indexing? That's usually a yes, but sometimes you have some issues there. Right. And so you just have to solve those. Then you're really moving into like, this is indexing now, is it ranking? And so I'm looking at like my impressions, just are those growing in general and are we picking up keywords, you know, in Ahrefs or SEMrush or whatever you're using? Like, are those new pieces picking up those things? And as long as I'm seeing momentum, like those numbers are growing, I'm pretty happy in those first couple months. Eventually, you'll start seeing that traffic. And of course, like traffic for traffic's sake isn't what we're looking for. But as long as we've identified the right keywords and, and things ahead of time, that's all good. And I'll take that traffic there. Then I'm certainly watching keywords like and how they're uh not just like the total growing but the the positions but again these are like early indicators more than anything uh and then certainly like so again we're all plg so i'm definitely looking at free users and then looking at people subscribing those paid users that's like the simple funnel but i think there's a lot more here that both i've learned i think my first taste was at scribe where it was my first like true SaaS product rather than a review site. Uh, but then even at software, this is kind of evolving for me. And so there's like, we have ICP specific stuff. So we've set that in set a cohort with different, you know, different uh, credentials in a uh, mix panel. And so we can measure, you know, the, the people that are coming in with that specific ICP that we want. And so we can measure those and people, how they're coming into content or like is the content that we're creating generating those correct users, right? And so that's an interesting one. I've never had that uh, measurement before, but that's been really both interesting. And then it's been really useful for me is that certain types of content are really generating those and then those people stay around. And so 
for me, it's not just, did we get someone free to sign up, which is great, but really are those people going to be great customers and really happy and can we support them? So that's been an interesting one that's much deeper um, in the and connected to product than I've ever been before with uh, with metrics, with content. Um, we also have like things like our free trial starts. So again, we have this free user, we have a paid user, but there's several steps in between, right? So we've got our 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 trial in there and we've got also different product uh, usage metrics that I can watch as well. And so that isn't always with me, but I'm definitely partnering with like our growth team and product team to look at those things and what content is triggering some of those events or that usage. And if it's uh, lower than we'd expect, like what can we do? Are there experiments we can run? Is there other content that we can service in between? So that's often like there is a handoff. It's not all my responsibility, but I think there's a ton I can learn there and then also support what content needs to be surfaced or is there something we can do in that blog post to help educate, to show somebody uh, the, like how to even connect to you know, their data source or something like that. Like that's one of those metrics I can see is, did someone sign up? Then did they connect their data source, right? For you, that was Airtable, but it could be Google Sheets or HubSpot. And so maybe there's just little changes in that listicle that we can add or something that we can surface during that onboarding flow. So. A lot yeah. of different things. Uh, those are that's probably more in the minutia, but I hopefully that can help. Like that's what we're looking at in the PLG motion on uh, some additional metrics. Yeah, yeah, I do. It seems like this is the type of product you just have to be in the weeds because the user is in the weeds. Um, really cool. I, this is the part in every podcast where I say, okay, now you've you've heard Jacob describe it. Go to software and see what it looks like in person. You know, I think it's really helpful to hear it described uh, from the person who's operating it and then go, you know, view it in the same way that a potential customer would. And I feel like that's where our listeners often get like real inspiration for their own content marketing efforts. And also just kind of call out, you know, one thing I love about doing this podcast is it's like every business sends you down a totally different route. It's like, okay, here's the product, here's the customer, the way that you reach them, like you kind of have these tools, these levers you can pull, uh, but you end up landing on something so different depending on kind of those foundational things, the product and who the customer is. So just really interesting to hear about the work you're doing. And as a, as a customer, I can honestly say the product is, is great. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. Was, I love that. I saw like early in my stage at software that you were using it, that super path, which I'd used before is like, had been, you know, built on top of it and, and all this stuff. So uh, I love that. Appreciate that. And if people are looking like, honestly, send us like, let me know. I love going through product onboarding and seeing content, you know, and getting my own inspiration. But I also think like, so hopefully we've done some stuff really nicely, but also there's tons that we aren't seeing. So people, I love when like a writer or a different content director or something sends like, have you thought about this or this is broken or something's mm. missing here? Um, I don't know. Like it's very easy for us, especially at this stage, to, like build, ship and move to the next project, ship and move to the next project. And often that works really nicely, but you know, things can not connect or break or change over time. And so uh, all that stuff is always helpful and, you know, just love to, to connect with other content people. Amazing. Well, we'll put links in the show notes to software, obviously, and to your LinkedIn. Is that the best place to send folks to connect with you? Yeah, definitely. I talk on there all the time, try to answer all the messages and stuff like that. And just met a ton of people that way. So love connecting on LinkedIn to content folks. Cool. All right, cool. Links will be in the show notes. Jacob, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you to the folks at software for building a great product that I use every day. And uh, I hope we can do this again soon. Maybe we can get an update, you know, 12 months from now, like see how things have evolved. I love it. Let's do that. Thanks, Jimmy. Amazing. Take care.